Okay, a slightly different setup this time. Uh, we've moved the uh, workbench to the back of the workshop. Uh, it's not finished yet. I just needed to get this over here so I could start doing some work again as the workshop has been pretty much unworkable uh, over the last week or so. So yeah, just whacked this over here to get cracking and we've got a Ground Zero 10K on the bench and this is one of the newer ones which actually does 10K unlike the old ones which did about 8.5K. So yeah, this is a pretty decent board. It's used in many different uh, brands, uh, namely the Vibe Reaper 10K as well and also SPO Dynamics D10 I think uses this board. Um, this one has it split down the middle. There's two boards and they're split in the middle. And if I grab my other little camera here, I can show you what that looks like. Now this is kind of cool and kind of annoying at the same time because I, I get the idea of having the board split here but it's actually soldered um, from the bottom from factory um, but the solder connections aren't that great and when this amplifier is subjected to vibration what actually happens is these solder joints snap and then you lose rail on one side which is no good so as you can see the previous repair this has been hard soldered with some uh, copper wire here um, to go between the two boards just to make a solid connection going forward um, all the power previously will be transferred through these pins which does work I've seen it on a Lanzar 7k before um, but you know if you're gonna hard solder it might as well just make it one board and then you lose the issue with the vibration so this amplifier has come in with uh, output section dead on one side here as we can see this amplifier uses eight banks of output FETs we've got one two three four and the same on the other side the banks are driven as such, we've got four driver ICs and the first IC drives this bank and this bank high and low and the second IC drives this bank and this bank high and low and the same on the other side. So you've got bank one, two, three, four in a sense when you're looking at the ICs. Um, now this amplifier did have a single FET blown on this side uh, and I actually happen to have some of the exact same batch uh, I think from a previous amplifier that just happened to be using the same batch from the factory. What are the chances of that? But yeah, exact same batch number, date, everything from the factory that these FETs were produced. So I was able just to uh, pop a fresh one single FET in this side and they are still the exact same batch. Uh, but it did kill the driver on this side um, when this single FET blew. So we've taken the driver board out already and it was on headers which is very handy. Previous repairer obviously put headers in. Nice, good job. Means it's easy for us guys. We haven't got to go ahead and solder the, uh, the driver board out which can be a bit of a headache. So on the driver board here, let's, let's take a look at what's going on on this then. So you can see some remains of solder flux on the board here, more so on this side than on this side. So it looks like that this side had died before, the previous unprepared had done some repairs. Uh, there didn't look to be any reason that this had died other than perhaps the um, thermal paste was actually pretty old and it wasn't fresh, wasn't replaced by the previous repair tech so uh, it could have overheated, maybe they wasn't making a decent connection. Actually these don't look like they've got any solder paste on them whatsoever. Uh, these are the ones that were fitted so maybe that's why uh, we had some failed fits on this side. So let's have a look at this driver board then. So yeah, as, as I said earlier we've got four driver ICs and each IC will power two banks of FETs, one high and one low. Now, things that commonly fail on these boards, they're a bit of a nightmare, and if you've got an amp failure, you need to pull this board out and pretty much just replace everything, even if it's reading kind of okay, because you can't trust it once it's gone down. So I've pulled all four original driver ICs off the board. We're going to replace all of those with fresh ones. Now, these ICs are often scratched off with the name to prevent you from reading it. So if we take the, one of the originals here, where the bloody hell has it gone? So yeah, as you can see, Ground Zero have uh, scratched off the name of this chip. And if you don't do amp repair all the time, you might not know what these chips are. If your driver board looks like this, or similar, with only two ICs rather than four, then your chip will be an IRS 21844S. And that is the most common half-bridge driver on this style of Korean amplifier board. And they are used in all sorts of different amplifiers, all different sorts of different boards. Uh, yeah, pretty decent chip, but quite fragile and often blow when the amplifier goes down. Now, in addition to these chips, you also need to look out for the following parts, which will probably die if, uh, or might die if the amplifier goes down. And that is these four Zener diodes here, and these four capacitors here. So check all those, make sure none of them are shorted or open. You should see uh, about 300 on your multimeter set to diode setting, um, on the Zener diodes and on the capacitors with the ICs removed, you should see uh, an infinite 
charge on the diode setting on the multimeter so you put the probes one way around it should beep for a fraction of a second and then go to one or infinite or overload or whatever your your, your uh, multimeter says for infinite um, other things to take note of is these little transistors here this little one here and this little one here are prone to dying I've done some testing on this board and it looks like the amplifier went down in a pretty undramatic way although the drivers were damaged these Zeno diodes actually survived as did the capacitors as did these little transistors at the top also worth checking all of these um, resistors and capacitors at the top here either side of the transistor because they can die as well so just make sure that they all read within tolerance as per their rating which this might focus on because I've got a macro lens Ooh, that's pretty close closest you've ever been on this channel <laughs> So yeah, just read off the uh, the ohm reading on there, um, make sure that it's pretty much within tolerance and you should be good to go. Now, sometimes, but not that common, you'll find that these three chips as well might have some issues. Um, now, these will consist of a 072C, a LM211 or 311, and what will the other one be? Uh, a 9203 perhaps uh, and this just deals with generation of the switching wave and protection circuit so yeah sometimes they die if the drivers go down in a drastic way and pull along the uh, 072 along with it or the LM211 but not as common and you will probably be able to fire the amplifier up on a small power supply if these do have issues and it won't fire up but you won't actually cause any damage and then you'll, you'll know you should be able to replace these uh, if you don't get any drive going along the board itself uh, we've got the gate resistors here to take note of these are probably going to be all okay they're pretty high rating and the protection circuits are quite quick on these um, it didn't damage the power supply uh, which is I'm fucking relieved because that is a humongous power supply don't want to be touching that if I can avoid it a whole bunch of 064 ends very expensive repair if that goes down yeah fucking although got a bank of eight drivers there and another eight oh there's fucking there's 16 drivers there another 16 drivers there 32 drivers now not looking forward to repairing that if that goes down but we're all okay this is okay other things to take note of on these style of amplifiers we've got some um, resistors here which are across the the ground sort of the virtual ground of the output and they sometimes go down they should be uh, a, uh, a low value resistor um, somewhere around about sort of 20 ohm range uh, and also we've got these these green things are inductors and they should read about five Five ohms uh, and sometimes they go completely short or open um, the legs usually break off the ends and as you can see here one has been previously replaced that is the same value just a slightly different case so first things first then I'm gonna go ahead and turn my hot air gun on and we are going to uh, put some new driver chips on this so I've got a little pack of driver chips here and you need to be pretty careful with these not to heat them too much because they are temperature sensitive as well uh, ooh. Uh, I thought I had, oh I do have, I have four of these which is perfect, four brand new ones, all the same batch which is good and let's get my little tweezers. What we want to do is heat the board up first, get all the solder melted on these uh, pads and they uh, all have pretty good fresh looking solder beads on them because I went through with the soldering iron earlier and put new uh, pads on them. So I'm just going to put a little bit more solder flux on here. Heat up the board and then we're going to drop the IC on, making sure to take note of the orientation of the IC. It has a little, uh, what is it, a little arrow there next to pin number one, so we need to get that right. Whoops. And this makes the IC upside down with the text and that's the same case for all of them. It is incredibly important you get the orientation correct, otherwise things will end badly. Boom. Cool, cool, cool. So just going to take a quick zoom in on this, so you can see that that is attached nicely. Ah, solder flux looks horrific, doesn't it? There we go. So we've got each leg nice there, big nice ball of solder. Uh, that's seated pretty well, so we're just going to go ahead and do the same to all the rest of them now. There we go, looking pretty good. Uh, and it looks much nicer that side than it does this side, which had all the uh, old solder flux from a previous tech. Um, I like to use, actually, uh, I did used to have some of the gunky stuff before, and I, th I thought it was great actually, it seemed to work pretty well. And then I got this stuff, which is 
like really liquid, really like it's very watery, and it's actually more like an alcohol type. Uh, it evaporates very, very, very quickly as soon as you apply the heat gun. Um, but I thought, ah, oh, this is crap. This isn't working properly. But actually, it works phenomenally, and it doesn't leave any crap. It evaporates and cleans as it works. So I actually now much prefer this watery type of uh, solder flux over the gunky stuff. Right, cool. Now we've put the drivers on this board. Everything else checks out okay on there. So we can slot this back into the nice handy headers that the previous tech left there for us. Let's get this wire out of the way. Let's pop it back in there. It's a snug fit with these headers. Push that in nice and tight. Cool, so now we're ready to fit two new banks of FETs in here where they blew. I've got a, a line of FETs here which actually I've taken from a, a, a used amplifier. I think it was one of the Sinudo masks, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, however, I'm going to say something which might be controversial, but using FETs from a used amplifier like this where I've salvaged them from one that blew. Now I know that these FETs were uh, taken from a batch of FETs that didn't blow in the amplifier and the driver was intact. So this set wasn't subjected to any stress from the amplifier blowing. And I know because these were fitted by the original amplifier manufacturer that they are legit, genuine, proper FETs. None of this, oh, did it come from a reputable source or did the reputable source get them from somewhere that just fucked up and bought them from some crappy source. I know that these are legitimate, 100% decent, solid FETs. I'm going to check them on the transistor tester anyway to make 100% sure. Uh, secondly, I'm doing this repair for the customer on a massively reduced cost. I'm doing him a bit of a favour here. Uh, I've let him know that we're using used FETs, doesn't have a problem with that. Um, because if the FETs haven't been subjected to any stress, then they will all be good to go as they were new. And this batch of FETs here actually comes from an incredibly similar batch from the factory as the originals in this amplifier, which makes it even better. They actually come from the same factory, the same year and just have a slightly different run number which is f ideal really um I, I you know okay ideally i'd want to use the same batch in all of these but i don't have any of these ones that came in the amplifier uh but this is the second best and they are in different banks so that's not a problem at all in fact they're on a completely different ic i think yeah they are we've got a high side and a low side here on one ic and then the second ic here runs this one so they're not even on the same driver they're on a complete separate driver and they are the same factory code same year code just a different run number and they will have neon identical specs and they're in different banks anyway so we're going to go ahead and fit these in make sure she's all working good to go and then we'll power her up and see what happens right cool now all the fets have been replaced we can take the multimeter diode setting just as a quick preliminary check before we fire anything up to make sure that there's no obvious faults with the uh, board driver board in take your two probes and you just want to whack it on the gate and the drain, I think that is, yeah. Gate and drain, and you can flip it around. So on the one way round, with the black on the gate, you should have somewhere between 550 and 600. Uh, we've got a 582 on this bank. And if we then take it to this bank, we should have roughly the same, 582. And then this the next bank, we will probably have slightly different because uh, it's a different bank of uh, FETs. So yeah, pretty much the same, 597, that's well acceptable. And uh, this side, we have the same again as well. If we flip them, we should have a high number, about 1200 or so. Um, let's have a look, it will climb up. Uh, there we go, yeah, 1220 on that bank. And what have we got this bank? Ooh, some different numbers going on this bank. So we've got 1582. So that, that uh, leads to uh, hints towards a potential issue, the 12. Now that might not be an issue, let's just see what it is the other side, because if it, if it tallies up the other side with the middle ones being 12 and the outer ones being 15, then I'm going to say that that is actually okay. Okay, so the other side we're climbing, and we're only going to climb to what, side 920? Okay, so there's still some digging we need to do then on this amplifier, because we have inconsistent uh, readings, 200, this, this this isn't right, that shouldn't climb up like that. Let's remove the driver board and see whether that still does that or whether it goes away. Got 350 and climbing, and climbing there, so what about this side? Okay, so we should have nothing, there shouldn't be any readings on these banks of FETs, there shouldn't be any readings at all on the gate and the drain. Yeah, so there's something not right with these ones. Alright, so it turned out that on the other side, whilst there wasn't any more completely shorted FETs, 
there were some that weren't reading correct and it was causing them to re-give a value on the multimeter with the driver board removed between the gate and the drain which it shouldn't do there should be no reading on the multimeter when probed between either way of these two with the driver board out and there was on this side uh, and I have found the issue there was a couple that weren't shorted but they are no longer a MOSFET they are a diode with a high resistance uh, so that's the first one there that was um, that was wrong so it's a good job that we go through is, is always worth knowing what these things should look like on the multimeter so that before you fire the amp up you can go around every single FET and just make sure that everything reads as it should so let's put the last leg on that one and let's see this is another one that I read slightly out on the board let's just see what this one comes up as yeah, so this one's no longer a fair either. This is just a series of diodes now um, with the leaking between them. So that's no good at all. Now, all the others, they seem to now be reading fine. The board does seem to be reading okay now that these ones are out. However, I don't trust it. So I have two options here. I can either fire the board up on a very low supply, let it switch for a second and see which ones, if any, heat up and whether there are any um, square waves on this side at all. Um, or pull the whole lot out, read every single one of them and replace the banks which are still good and replace the ones which aren't with fresh ones. <sighs> I think we're going to go with option two to be on the safe side as this is such a big amplifier. Let's fucking rip them all out and start again. Okay, new FETs came through like bum. So we've got a whole load of batch 1G47AA. Um, we've also got a few 1G47AB and 1G47AC. I need 16, ideally the same, which we have 16 of the double A batch. Wicked stuff. So let's go and drop these in. Uh, we've got our driver board still in here. Seems to be okay, so we'll whack that back in as well. Fire her up slowly, see what happens. Okay, so we're loaded up with all the FETs and I'm going to leave the driver board out for the first power because I just want to make sure that there's no issues on the board itself. Um, so we're going to fire the amplifier up, get the rail voltage up to its maximum and just measure everything, make sure we are all good to go. And then, only then will I drop the driver board in and see if we have any switching. So, 130 volts on the positive rail, minus 129.7 volts on the negative rail. Green, uh, blue light on the amplifier and full of switching on the rectifiers so that's a good sign now let's just wait for that voltage to fall down a little bit because I don't want to be putting my finger on the flipping uh, 126 volts even though I'm not grounded I don't trust it so uh, yeah, power supply is still cold which is good let's wait for that to fall down a bit before I touch it and check for heat and uh, so at this point the capacitors are still charged I've got to be flipping very careful with my probe uh, if I touch two pins together that short to ground you get a massive spark like I'm talking big firework things flipping your ears like will just yeah you, you get that ringing in your ears when you have a massive pop or explosion and it's bright as hell your eyes are like blinded and your ears are going pee and I'm talking from experience here I've definitely I've shorted out 160 volt DC on a capacitor rail and it was not fun yeah we're good on these so we're pretty safe now to uh, put the driver board back in and uh, let's just move my camera down so you can see what I'm doing uh, my other camera the batteries are still charging so we just got the one view for the, for now, and uh, yeah, I'll just wait for the voltage just to um, fall down a little bit. I don't like dropping the driver board in when there's still like 90, 80 volts sitting on the board, because if there's any slight issues with the driver board, if there's any shorts, I'll drop it in and boof, get a big spark in my hand perhaps, so yeah, not, not too fun. So I'm just going to wait for that to uh, fall down a little bit. We can speed up the process by, uh, if you're working on a big amplifier like this and you want to probe the board and you want to touch things and move it around and you don't want there to be like 80 volts sitting on the rails, um, you can speed up the falling of the rail voltage by taking like, I don't know, a 47 ohm resistor. It's a pretty good value for doing this with. Uh, well, here we go. Got some, uh, got a 47 ohm here. There we go. So I've just got a long piece of wire. Uh, it's actually got a jack on it. I forgot, I forgot to have a jack on it. Um, so I can put the, the jack end on the, um, on the amplifier's ground and then I can touch that on there and it should clear the rail voltage. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so that's dropped to 10 volts, pretty safe. I'm just going to whack the uh, driver board back in place like so. 
So let's take our power supply now, switch the power supply back on, and um, then what we're going to do is we're going to probe the. We're going to take two probes this time because uh, I want to see what's going on with the. Uh, we're going to put the this probe on the on the rail so we can see the rail when it gets to its top, and then this one we're going to put on the output switch. Uh, so we're going to be able to see the switching when it kicks into into play. So let's take this probe and put this on the low side middle pin, which is this one here. Okay, cool. So we're all loaded up now. I've got to turn number two. Uh, so on my scope, I've got to turn number two on. Okay, so I've got to go ahead and activate um, probe number two which we're on 50 volts, uh, which is good. So we've got probe number two, which is on the, uh, the DC rail, uh, and probe number one, which is on the switching side of the low side. So now let's apply some power to the board again and see those rails climb. Okay, there we go. So we can see the rails now starting to climb. We've got the uh, 29 volts on the uh, high side middle pin and zero volts on the low side middle pin, which is how it should be. 58 volts. Okay, so we've got a switching wave there, but it looks a bit weird. That yeah, doesn't look very good at all, does it? What's going on there? Hmm. Not very good at all. So we need to probe the low side now. We will have a wave riding along the low side there. So um, if I AC couple that and turn that down. That's not a very nice looking switching wave at all, is it? Okay, hmm. Okay, yeah, everything is stone cold still, so I don't think we've got any risk of blowing anything up. So let's leave this on for a bit longer then, seeing as we've got nothing that's getting hot. So the switching is struggling to, to come on. It's, it's clicking in and out very quickly. Um, so I'm thinking this is a driver board issue, so I need to pull the driver board out again. Right, so a couple of things I'm going to try on this driver board then, is I'm going to try and change the 2A and 1A transistors here and these are responsible for um, sending the uh, different drive waves to the high and low sides. Okay, so remembering which position they're in, we've got the 1A on this side and the 2A on this side. Uh, so I'm just going to heat the board up first. So that's our 1A. I'm just going to put this down to the side because these might be alright and I'm running low on these. So if these are alright, then I'll reuse them. So that's those two removed. Okay, so that's the 2A in place. There we go, cool, cool. So let's put this back in the board then and see if that has solved it. I don't have massively high hopes. These issues tend to be flipping running around for ages looking for stuff. Um, it's very unusual that you saw this the first time with, uh, with the diagnosing guesswork. No, it hasn't. Still looks, uh, still massively struggling to build that that wave there. So it wasn't the two A and one A then. So those two um, ones that I took off the board, I can put those somewhere safe because they were okay. So it's not that. So next thing we can try is. Uh, Right, so I just spent the last half an hour populating another board. So this was the original board from this amplifier. I just want to rule out any issues with the board. And rather than going through and placing every single flipping component, I actually have got uh, a board here which seems to be pretty pretty good. Um, it was just missing the driver IC. So I swapped the driver ICs out as they are new and unlikely to be the problem. Uh, and I also swapped the new 1A and 2A that I swapped in. And I've put new 2Ds on. So yeah, fresh driver board. It's unlikely to have the same issue is this one so I'm just trying to rule out where the issue lies um, so let's fire this up and see what happens right so what we've done here is I've actually taken the pins which are the drive wave outputs from the IC chips and I've bent them forward slightly so that they don't sit in the headers 
Um, and the reason for that is that allows me to put the driver board back in place and allow the driver board to fire up and to start its switching process but not actually go to drive the FETs. And what I can do then is with these pins that are bent outwards I can take my probe and read off the switching waves from each of them and I should see where the issue lies. So what we're going to do is slide this back into the headers like so and we've got the four pins here and the four pins here which are sticking outwards. Okay so the other camera has finally uh, finished charging one of the batteries which is good. It means I can show you this uh, dual view. So now this is plugged back in and the pins are out. I'm just going to check, I haven't actually put a, um, a sine wave through the amplifier yet. I'm just going to see whether it oscillates without needing that. Okay, so rail voltage is sitting there fine and the FETs aren't doing anything. They're not heating up. No, okay, cool. Alright, cool. So now let's probe one of the um, outputs here. Okay, there we go. So we've got a bit of a wobbly wave, which is not a problem. Um, they do sometimes look like this. Okay, so that output looks okay on that one. It's a little bit wobbly, but we'll see what the others look like. Let's go to the second one. Okay, so there's nothing on the second one. So first one we've got wave, second one we have got nothing. Third one. Wave. Fourth one nothing so this could be a difference between high and low the fact that we had two that weren't emitting a square wave could be an ic down or it could just be that it's self oscillating on one side so let's check the other side okay so we've got wave there on that one uh, no wave so then we should have wave and then we should have no wave okay cool so they all look to be okay. So now I'm going to uh, drive a sine wave into the amplifier and uh, see whether that changes anything. See if we get uh, square waves on those ones that didn't have a square wave just a second ago. So I'm just going to take my RCA leads down here. Alright, so we've got our frequency generator here um, on the phone. I'm just going to go and hit start on a 40 hertz. And let's see whether we have square waves on those ones that didn't before. I will probably actually have to change my scope so we can see 40 hertz nicely okay cool so 40 hertz is starting to 40 it's now switched to 40 hertz because we have the input signal so okay cool 40 hertz that looks okay on drive so second pin this one didn't have a wave on it before and it still doesn't okay Third one has 40 hertz. Fourth one, nothing. Over this side, 40 hertz. Nothing. 40 hertz. Nothing. Okay, so I've seen amplifiers like this before where only half the side oscillates uh, even when driven with a sine wave. So I don't think that there's an issue with the drive then as such. I think we should be looking then at issues on the board itself, um, such as pull down resistors, um, gate resistors, flipping, something, something on the board, I think. Well, shit, check this out. Now this is a trace which is on one of the voltage regulators for this uh, amplifier. As you can see here, we've got the um, voltage regulators, and these will deal with the 15 volts or the 12 volts, plus, minus, 5 volts, etc. Any strange small voltages that the drive circuits need. And obviously, this trace has either blown open or has become damaged by, well, who knows really? That's a bit of a weird one. I've not seen that before on a regulator. So we're going to solder that back up and try the amp again, and um, perhaps that'll fix it. Right, let's try it again. So 118 volts there, nothing going bang yet. So I've just got to wait for switching to kick in. Huh. So, oh wow, something stinks. Something smells bad. Ah, shit. What smells bad? Why does that smell bad? Is it coming from the power supply? No. 
the hell? Something smelled very bad just then. Ah, it seems to be these voltage regulators that smells bad. So maybe they blew and took out the trace. Yeah, that stanks. So, okay, let's go ahead and change those voltage regulators before anything else then. So we've taken the two 12 volt regulators out and there is not a short on the board. So it seems that one of these has died. And that would be correct. So this one has died, causing the short circuit and causing the smelly heat on the board. And this one has also died. So we've got two dead uh, 12 volt regulators there that we need to replace. Now, just having a look on the board, I just wanted to make sure there was nothing else funky going on. I'm just going to zoom in here. Now, I've spoken before about these inductors, these little green things. Believe it or not, they are tiny inductors and they should read a 5 ohm resistance across them. So we take a multimeter, read across them. We should have a 5 on the screen, which we do. 5, 5, etc. This one has been replaced before and it's either uh, gone out of tolerance, it's now reading. 2 ohm which it might just be because this is a different style different type um, but I imagine it should have the same uh, resistance as all the rest of them that is what I have read from the copious amounts of research I've done before I started doing that before I repaired properly um, now this one down here which was next to the regulator this one is just reading as nothing. Uh, if we put it on the uh, resistance setting, um, it should be a low resistance and it's just it's not anything. So we've got a dead inductor there. Uh, we need to pull that and replace that. Uh, I believe I do have some spare uh, inductors for this uh, that look a little bit like this brown one. So these have codes on them, black, uh, violet and yellow. Uh, that denotes the inductance of said inductor. Uh, so let's see what I've got in here. Okay, here we go, perfect. I've actually got uh, an array of uh, black, violet, yellow, or yellow, violet, black, whichever way you want to read it, with the gold, which means uh, that is the uh, accuracy. So let's just measure these and see what these are in terms of resistance. See if they're 5 ohm or 2 ohm. Let's put that back to there. Okay, so these are actually 2.5 ohms, so that one there is probably fine. Um, as long as obviously the inductance reading is the same, which it is because it's the same markings, then we shouldn't have any problems. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the leg back in the board for that one because I lifted the leg there because I wasn't sure if that was correct or wanted to read it outside of circuit. And that's what you can do if you want to, if you're not sure if a component is working or whether it's just something else in the circuit that is causing it to read differently, you can just lift one of the legs and measure it outside of circuit that way. So I've just got to heat the pad up and just push it back down into circuit. So let's remove this one then that's dead. It has gone open. There we go. There's our little blown inductor. So yeah, I can't really, it doesn't show any physical signs of damage and they barely ever do, which is the, uh, the annoying thing. Orientation is not important with these. It's just a little bit of copper wound coil inside here around a core flip it back over solder in place and cut the leads now this was quite easy to spot this inductor uh, but what i'm going to do is check around this circuit area for anything else that has gone down because um, the fact that it took out uh, both of the voltage regulators it could be there could be some other issues around this circuit so i'm going to go ahead and just check all the diodes uh, and various other bits around this voltage regulation circuit to make sure that it doesn't blow again when we fit the new regulators so we've got a diode here um, so this should read if we put it on diode beep setting, we should have a high number or a or a infinite reading one way, which we do, and the other way we should have a value between three and five hundred perhaps. There we go, four four four. Four 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 five, whatever. Yeah, four four four. So that, that seems to be okay. There's not an obvious fault there with that diode. Um, same over here with this one. Uh, now what have we got? We've got some capacitors here. We just want to make sure now these these ones with the uh, the vent uh, scorches on the top they generally will blow open visually if they die. This little ceramic one here won't, so we just want to make sure there's not a short circuit across this one, which there isn't. Um, we've got some resistors over here as well. Um, again, resistors or often unless they're fireproof will often show visual signs of damage if they have blown this one looks a little bit discolored perhaps so let's just make sure the resistance is correct on this one this resistor here which looked a tiny little bit off colored 
not maybe not maybe it's just my eyes but it looks a little bit off color i wanted to read it uh, and going by the resistor calculator i don't know all the lines and bars off my top of my head just yet it comes out at a 220 kilo ohm resistor but in circuit it reads as a 20 kilo ohm resistor so obviously I wasn't sure whether it was actually correct or not so you have to lift one leg and measure it outside of circuit and lo and behold it measures as roughly a 220 kilo ohm resistor with intolerance so that's absolutely fine I would say that after checking uh, the various parts around the regulation circuit um, that we are good to go to fit some new 7812s there doesn't seem to be anything else around here that's uh, obviously dead so I think it's a weird one that whether the trace was blown open because of of, um, a fault that just caused excessive current draw and blew the trace or whether the trace was just damaged by well I don't know really it's, it's a weird one it must just be excessive current draw then uh, when this amplifier went down I just didn't spot that trace earlier which is strange now I just need to find some new uh, 7812s okay so voltage regulators have arrived these new KA 7812s and I'm going to power it up with the driver board out to start with as the driver board is the main thing that uses these voltages from here um, the IC chips etc require um, this lower voltage and it takes a reference from the uh, rail voltage and uh, doesn't actually produce a legitimate 12 volts uh, reference to amp ground but it produces um, 12 volts reference to rail so it will be uh, 12 volts uh, higher than the negative rail or 12 volts lower than the positive rail so let's just pop these in here uh, we need to maintain the original height so they line up against the heatsink correctly okay flip it over I hate flipping these big amps over because they're so flexible but what we're gonna do is use the bench and we're just gonna Flip it like that onto its side first. Then we're going to pick it up like this because it doesn't bend this way. And we're going to rest it against the edge of the desk and then pop it down like this. And that way you don't bend the board. Just, just about reaches. And just reverse the uh, technique. Bring it slightly over the edge. Pull it up from this way. Use the edge to lever it. Once it gets vertical do that and then bring it down flat again okay power supply ready let's see what's going on as you can see on the scope there the two lines are getting further apart and that's because I've got the probe on the positive uh, output of one of the rectifiers and then the negative is obviously the negative 12 volts and if I put it onto the other one we've also got so these are the two negative 12 volts um, so these will generate the, the rail so let's just make sure these aren't getting hot no it's staying pretty cold so fingers crossed I can give it a full whack. Okie dokie, 98 volts there. Uh, I don't, I'm not particularly keen on touching the 98 volts, so we're just going to roll with it. Cool, well that seems to be okay. Uh, I've got 130 volts there. Um, on the output of the positive rectifier and of the um, negative uh, from the rectifier uh, ro re re rectifier regulator rectifier regulator flipping rector this that the other okay cool so I'm gonna wait for that voltage to sink back down to safe levels through the uh, pull down resistors on the output rails and then I'm gonna um, fit the uh, driver board back on um, and uh, I don't know, fingers crossed, we may see this amplifier fire up and switch full duty cycle, fingers crossed. Okay, driver board's back in, so this is the main moment of truth then. Um, what I'm going to do is probe one of the FETs instead. Uh, I want to get some switching waves going on, I want to see whether it actually switches or not, so let's put it on that one there, so we can read the rail voltage and the switch at the same time. So, okay, whew. A little bit scary but let's just see what happens I mean this is a low current power supply but things can still go wrong with uh, this amount of current uh, 61 volts just to make sure these aren't getting hot no it's not getting hot yet aha okay wicked 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 so that came in pretty quick okay so that was a little bit of switching that's 80 volts and we already have a, a output wave switch um, and that split second of switch can uh, generate heat on the outputs if they're not happy. So I just want to go ahead and just go around and feel them. I've got 80 volts DC sitting on there, but I'm not grounded, so we're all, we're all good. 
Okay. 135, 138 volts, and we have output switch, and it reached full duty. Fantastic. Okay. Well, that's good. So that means that the um, re regulators were the issue before then that were preventing this from uh, going switching fully. Um, we reached the top rail voltage with the 12 volts worth of input, which is good. Uh, the waves looked pretty decent. They uh, appeared very quickly as well. Um, so that's all good news. What we need to do now is wait for this voltage to sink back down again and just um, make sure there's no heat on any of these. So I'm actually just going to feel the front of them so I don't touch the metal. I mean, I'm not grounded, but 130 volts is a little bit scary, you know what I'm saying? So, okay. Yep, uh, seems pretty cold over this side. Yep, doesn't seem to be any heat over this side either. Okay, cool. I think that's uh, that's pretty good. Um, what I want to do is um, I want to probe the... Uh, low side switch, um, sorry, low side drive. I want to uh, probe the low side drive, which is going to be on uh, this one of these legs. Uh, and I hate moving the probes when there's still almost uh, 90 volts sitting there. So I'm going to wait for this to come down again, move the probes around, and I'm going to probe the low side drive wave to the low side of uh, FETs on the outputs and zoom in on the scope so we can see what the low side drive wave looks like, which is a very good indicator of how healthy the drive circuit is and how well it's powering these outputs. Um, the outputs on this amplifier, they are pretty much solely dependent on the low side drive wave. The low side drive wave, it uh, rides along the negative rail voltage. You have a negative rail, and on this style of amplifier, uh, there's a tiny little wave, maybe only three or five volts uh, peak to peak there, um, and it rides along the negative rail, and it turns the, well, it, base, it sets the switching frequency for the class D operational output section. And that low side switch wave look, needs to look uh, as close to a square, it needs to look clean as possible. It will always have a bit of a dip on the way up, and it may have a step on the way down, because it is such a tiny voltage, such a tiny wave riding along this, this massively uh, low voltage rail, um, and it's incredibly fast as well. It is very high frequency, so it won't look perfect like the power supply section drive wave does but it needs to look decent enough to turn the effects on the output side on and off quickly and effectively uh, so that they uh, don't heat up and don't try and power each other uh, and so that there's no sort of power kind of floating around that shouldn't be there uh, once the the drive circuit has told it to switch off so um, yeah let's wait for this to fall back down and switch it over in order to actually view the low side drive wave effectively, obviously it's riding along this negative rail. So if we power the amp up, we're going to, the line's going to go all the way down there, we're going to get this tiny little wave on the scope screen, which is no good, you can't really see what it's doing. So change your scope to um, AC coupling, and that will uh, block DC from uh, showing up on the screen, and it'll only show uh, waves. So we can see this tiny wave riding along the negative rail without actually seeing the negative DC rail on the screen. So, and then we are at 50 volts uh, divide at the moment, so in order to zoom in and see that, we're gonna go all the way down to two volts divide, um, so we can see the wave nice and big on the screen, and then we're gonna uh, turn the time divide uh, a little bit so that it's we spread the wave out so we can see it nice and clear on the screen. Okay, cool. Time to fire her up again, and let's check the low side drive. And there is our low side drive. So see that? That looks pretty square shaped to me. For a low side drive on an amplifier this big, that is not a bad looking low side drive at all. And um, the reason it looks a little noisy is uh, probably to do with how the scope is finding ground reference through the power supply. I've not got the scope directly grounded to the amplifier because it is all running through the mains. I've not got my scope uh, floating yet, uh, which is something I should do. But um, no, tiny little step on the way down, slight curve on the way up. That is perfect. The, this little dip here is partly to do with the capacitance of the gate. That's very small, not an issue whatsoever. This is a very, very healthy looking low side drive. So these FETs should be being powered perfectly and shouldn't be getting warm in the slightest. Uh, that's been on for a fair few seconds now. Let's turn the power supply off and feel for heat again. Just go through and check these. No, we're staying stone cold. Okay, fantastic stuff. 
So this is now a successful repair. There are a few things I want to do before this goes off back to the customer, however, and one of those is I want to um, remove these uh, kind of skanky looking headers on the uh, driver board. So I'm gonna take the driver board out once the voltage is lowered to a safe level, um, desolder all the um, headers and solder the driver board directly into the board um, because I don't know if I trust those headers that much to um, not drop a connection under vibration if this amp was mounted to a box. Uh, and then also what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, change how this amplifier uh, clamps its uh, FETs to the heatsink through the um, insulation pad. Now the pads that came with this amplifier, uh, they're like little bits of cardboard with a kind of glittery kind of finish that comes off on your finger almost. Uh, I don't know what um, material that is off the top of my head, but it's the first time I've seen it really used in amplifiers. Uh, most of the time you get this kind of spongy foam stuff, um, which I think I've used all up. It's like a grey spongy foam stuff, um, which is good because it ensures that um, the MOSFET is uh, fully covered, the back of it is fully covered even, so even if there's some slight um, bumps or dips on the actual heatsink itself where it has been, um, the heatsink has been made in the factory, it's not quite flat or the, uh, the sponge will absorb that kind of dip or bump and it will uh, ensure that the MOSFET is nice and tight against it with the whole of the back of the FET transferring heat to the heatsink um, and also, I don't know, they're just they're much easier to work with and I always load it up with a fresh thermal paste throughout this whole amplifier. Most of the time amplifier you've got come work, coming into the workshop, it's been uh, being used for a few years and thermal paste is usually cheap shit that they use in the factory and it's usually out of date then as well so I always refresh it no matter what and I use this stuff and this is, uh, I don't know whether this camera will focus very well but this is HY880 and this is by a company called Halnazai, I think that's how you say it, Halnazai. Um, now this is a thermal paste which I did a bit of research on. I was using MX4 uh, but that's pretty expensive and I didn't want to use MX5 because MX5 is actually conductive. It contains silver which is no good when you've got these high voltages, 150, 180 volts with a 14, 15 volts worth of input um, and that will just short to the case easy. Rubbish. No, don't want to use MX5. You need to use a fully synthetic uh, thermal paste and the HY880 in many tests and reviews outperformed the MX4 and was seriously cheaper um, and so far I've used it in loads of amplifiers that I've repaired and the thermal uh, performance of the amplifier has drastically improved over the factory paste so highly recommended for amplifier repair HY880 get it in a 30 gram tube squeezy thingy um, it doesn't come with this uh, nozzle tip it comes with a just uh, the end but I've put this on here it makes it easier to squirt it down into the case uh, but yeah I'm gonna refresh all the thermal paste on there make sure that it is getting that that's that's because at the end of the day the heat dissipation from these FETs is the only thing that allows this amplifier to do its rated power. Um, these FETs on their own, not mounted to a heatsink, can only do about 3 or 4 watts before they explode. So how do you get these FETs to do nearly bloody 10k with all of them? Um, they have to dissipate the heat that they generate doing the power um, in order to keep doing more power uh, and so if you've got a crappy um, continuity to heatsink if it can't dissipate the heat to the heatsink and the, he the FET just heats up its own and can't get rid of the heat then it's going to explode and you're going to have a failed amplifier or one that's not doing rated power so very important to uh, sort out your thermal compounds and thermal transfer to the heatsink as that is the only thing that is stopping your amplifier from overheating and potentially failing so yeah uh, yeah, well, got to get in the Christmas spirit, and this jump pot is so warm, like all these crappy jumpers is just the warmest thing I've ever worn, and it's fantastic in the workshop, so yeah, this amplifier originally came with this uh, thermal pads, which is like some kind of mica sheet, uh, but it's the wrong type, it's not very good, it's not going to be optimal for this amplifier, so as a result, because this is such a, a beast of an amplifier, we want to make sure that it gets rid of all its heat effects effectively. Uh, I've gone and ordered myself some of this. Now this is a pretty expensive sheet. Uh, this is Silpad 900 um, by a company called, I'm going to pronounce it completely wrong, it's a weird one like Burke Est or something, I don't know. But yeah, Silpad 900 and this has an extremely low thermal resistance, extremely low and a very high breakdown voltage rating. So this is perfect for the amplifier. Um, and also it is uh, self adhesive on one side which is also very handy. Now because this is so expensive, rather than cutting a long strip and just running a strip 
along here I want to obviously save and use as little as this as possible so what we're going to do is we're going to take one of the FETs uh, the same uh, case FET and we're going to cut uh, the perfect size for the back of each FET and stick it to the back of each of these FETs so that it is the perfect size um, that also makes it easier when sliding into the heat sink it means we can just push the FET back onto the uh, heat sink and it's not going to be uh, out of center it's going to be perfectly centered stuck to the back of the FETs um, for optimum heat transfer which is what we want this is a 12 by 12 sheet and we should be able to do this full amplifier and only use maybe a quarter of it. Um, so that should obviously, this will do me nicely for many, many years to come hopefully because uh, it's not often that you have to replace this thermal pads on, on these amplifiers. Usually the ones they come with are sufficient but in this case they were not. Alright, that took a little while, so now we have cleaned all the backs of these with the um, alcohol, so we're just going to peel off the self-adhesive backing of these pads and start loading them up. So in hindsight, it would have been much easier just to cut strips for the whole lot of them. I wouldn't really have wasted much at all by the looks of it, and it would have made things a lot easier. This is taking flipping ages! But, oh well, some things work in your head and then in reality it's like, nah, it would have been easier the other way fam. And it's like, ah, oh, right out. Oh, finally done with that. Now the long task of putting all the clips back. Hey, my favorite. There we go. And repeat 40, no, what was it? 60 times, yep. Let's just fire it up on the small power supply one last time to ensure that there's no shorts or bits of solder that uh, found their way onto the board as we were putting it back into the case. Always a good idea to do a final check once you've reassembled it with a small power supply. Because if you dump it on a big power supply or battery and um, yeah, something's touching the case ground or a little bit of solder fell on uh, or something, then it's just wasted hours of your work and you'll start again. So always worth taking the time to hook up a small power supply for one last test. Uh, and let's see what she does. So, rail volts is climbing. No, 58 volts. Switching is enabled. So yeah, we're all good then. Blue light and uh, output switch is enabled. We've got a 145 volts on the output rail. No, sorry, 145 volts uh, RMS on the output switch and 123 volts on the uh, main rail. Yeah, I'm happy with that. It's absolutely stone cold. So let's whack on the big power supplies. And uh, obviously this is a 10K amplifier and uh, the power supply in the workshop is nowhere near big enough to uh, actually uh, do 10K. Uh, actually bench this properly to full power to clipping point on a 1 ohm static load. So what we're going to do is we're going to just bench up to a safe level for these power supplies. So they're 2K each. So I should be able to get around about 4, 5K uh, out of this amplifier um, on the bench here with the supplies that we've got and uh, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna leave it on for a fair bit of time because obviously we won't be anywhere near clipping so just to make sure that the amplifier is happy doing some relatively decent clamped power obviously 10k amplifier when you use it uh, on, a sta on a reactive load with a speaker it won't do anywhere near its full 10k of power there will be impedance rise and it will do less power so if I can actually bench 4 or 5k out of this then that's getting not nearish to the power that it will legitimately do wired up uh, in a car. Big supplies are turned on and uh, we've got the remote on the foot pedal so let's just uh, turn the gain down and hit the remote. Get this thing fired up. Okay, she's on and let's hit a tone. I'm just going to monitor the input voltage as well, it doesn't drop too low below 11.8. It's going to give us some power, it's going to pulse it here. 11.8, 11.7 there on the input, so yeah, 40 volts, probably clamping about 3.5, 4k here. Okay, so the supplies don't like that much power. So uh, yeah, we reached the limit of the supplies there. Okay, I think I have an issue with one of the supplies. I believe one of the supplies may have just gone down. 
Right, let's do this again then. So his father power supplies up again. Uh, 12.40, which is about right. Uh, we're just going to start with the game down on the minimum and uh, hit the remote on the foot pedal. And comes on straight away, blue light. Relays click in. And let's start doing some power then. So we're going to pulse up to about 45 volts. I don't want to go much higher than that because it tends to uh, cut the power supplies off. Um, and then this is doing some pretty reasonable power, continuous power as well, into a static one ohm load. Um, so this is a much more stressful environment than the amplifier would normally be used. Even in a bench test scenario, we are doing continuous power into a static one ohm load. I'm just going to vary the frequency a little bit as well. And you can see the voltage has dropped there. We're dropping down to uh, 11.9, 11.8 on the uh, power supplies there. And uh, we're getting going up to about 45, 48 volts on the output. So doing some pretty big continuous power here into these dummy loads. And uh, provided the amplifier continues to do this and doesn't show any signs of stress or strain, then uh, this will be good to go back to the customer. So yeah, this seems pretty good to be fair. If there were any underlying issues with the amplifier, doing this uh, sort of prolonged uh, dumping of power, these are getting pretty hot as well now, into these dummy loads would generally show the issue. Um, you know, if an amplifier does, if an amplifier idles but there's an issue, when it does power, the issue will present itself. If the amplifier is doing power like this, um, then generally we have a, a successful repair. Obviously I will do my endurance test, which uh, means 45 minutes of a static and reactive load test uh, over a long period of time at pretty high power. So provided it passes the endurance test, then we're safe to say that this is a very successful repair and they can go back to the customer for him to use uh, as hard as he likes pretty much on the subwoofer. So yeah, I'm just going to do this a bit more um, and uh, over the next few minutes just make sure that we are all happy and all good. And uh, yeah, the amplifier's heatsink, it's not getting warm or hot as such, but I can tell that it's not room temperature. Like, this side, the power supply, feels cold to the touch. This just feels just normal temperature, like room temperature to the touch. So the amplifier's outputs are generating some heat, obviously, to do this power. And we can feel that equally along with the whole heatsink here, which is ideal. You don't want any hot spots on the, on the heatsink. And uh, yeah, these dummy loads are getting pretty hot now as well. So there's definitely some big power being dumped into these. So um, yeah, like I say, endurance test we shall do next. 45 minutes worth of hard testing with a reactive and a static load. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that will pass with flying colours. And this can go back to the customer uh, to use as he likes. I hope this video has been insightful and interesting to you guys. It's not every day we get this such a big amplifier here to work on. And um, I hope that this gives you some tips and hints to work on amplifiers like this. Don't be put off by the size. All amplifiers are pretty much the same. You just There's just more of what there is. So this amplifier is the same as like a sort of 4 or 5k version of this board. It's just twice the size. So you just got twice the number of parts. So don't be put off by its size other than flimsing it around on the workbench of course. But yeah, if you can repair this type of board in a, in a half the size, then you should be able to do it in a 10k as well. It's uh, not too difficult once you grasp where the things are working and, and what, what to look out for and what's dead and what's not dead and stuff like that. So yeah, thank you for watching all this way to the end and um, stay subscribed if you want to see more interesting things. I've got uh, Brazilian amplifier technology videos on the way where we repair some Banda and some Tarams amplifiers, output sections as well, interesting stuff. So yeah, stay tuned and I shall catch you next time.